Hi everyone, Carol Ann here from SassyTownhouseLiving.com and today I'm so excited because we are interviewing Ken Murray and Ken has a lot of exciting things that he wants to talk to us about today, mainly a new book that he wrote called On Par, but we're going to be talking about his photography business and a lot of other exciting things as well. I just want to give you a quick intro as to who Ken is. He was born and raised in Hudson, Iowa. He joined the Air Force in 1986 and he earned his MBA in 1990 from the University of South Dakota. He was an instructor, evaluator, navigator on the KC-135 air refueling tankers and spent many years as an instructor navigator at the school at Randolph Air Force Base, Texas Murray. And he was also a combat veteran who flew missions in support of operations, operations just cause, Desert Storm, Allied Force, and he was also chief of combat operations at the Combined Air Operations Center, supporting Iraq freedom and enduring freedom. So as you can see, he's a great patriot and we thank him so very deeply for all of his years of service. He also served as editor of Torch Magazine, Air Education and Training Command's Safety Magazine, where his team won the International Blue Pencil Award for government communications. He's also a highly decorated Air Force officer and Ken retired from the Air Force on May 1st of 2011 as a Lieutenant Colonel after 25 years of service to our country. Aside from his many outstanding accomplishments, as I mentioned, he's also an author. And today we're here to talk to him about his book and also his business. So hi, Ken. Thanks hey, good so morning, much. Caroline. Thank you, you for bet. joining us. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, before we get into the book, which is absolutely fascinating, but I want to get to talk to you about your outstanding photography business. Um, can you talk to our listeners and readers? And for those of you that are listening to this via podcast, you can also check out an article that I will have live on Sassy Townhouse Living that will display all of Ken, most of Ken's or some of Ken's wonderful pictures that we're going to be talking about today. So could you talk to us a little bit about your freelance photography business, your drone photography, and just let our readers know exactly what it is that you do? I sure will. I, uh, I've been involved in photography since I was a kid. Uh, my parents had a, had a uh, weekly newspaper in Hudson, Iowa. So I grew up in the newspaper and publishing business with them and shot for them while I was growing up from the age of about 12 or so uh, through middle school and through high school. And then I went to the University of Northern Iowa, which is only like four miles from there. So I was able to, even while I went to college, I still shot for them, was the photo editor at the Northern Iowan, uh, which is the student newspaper there uh, for a year, for my junior year, I guess. And uh, so I've been shooting for a long time. Once I entered the Air Force, I carried my gear with me everywhere I went. and uh, got some great air-to-air -air stuff from the tankers, basically a, a platform you can shoot from anyway. And, uh, you know, shot images from all around the world. Every, every, every base we went to, I'd just carry my gear with me and shoot. Um, so it's, it's in my blood. Uh, I love it. It's a passion of mine. And uh, so what I did was in, in 2006, I was at Randolph over in San Antonio. And... I wanted to, I wasn't sure exactly when I was going to retire. I knew it was, you know, the, the, the end of my Air Force career was in, in sight. I just didn't know what year it ended up being 2011. But in 2006, I switched from uh, film to the digital realm and uh, bought digital cameras at the time. And um, I wanted to have, I set up Mach 3 photography. I wanted to set up a, a business that I could do part-time or on an as-needed basis while I was still active duty so that when I exited the Air Force uh, in my retirement, uh, I would have something already standing, freestanding that I could step into and, and go full bore then. And uh, so that's what I did. Um, uh, after I retired, I moved over to Houston. I'm in Houston now. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of, of sporting events and that sort of thing here that you can shoot. 
And so I started getting involved and making contacts and ended up, I got picked up by uh, Icon Sportswire. So I shoot the Texans and the Aggies and the Dynamo and Dash soccer teams here, the Astros, um, do that for Icon Sportswire. And then for Golf File, it's an Irish company. Um, I shoot for that agency. I shoot PGA and LPGA golf for them. So this year I, I shot 17 golf tournaments. So you're out the whole week. So I was out, you know, in upwards of six months out of the year this year, uh, traveling, living in hotels and eating out all the time. But I love it. Uh, it's it's a good time. Um, uh, we're always ready for football season. So I'm, you know, this is football time of year now. Um, so in the mix there, busy, busy all the time, Lot, lots of long days and late nights. Um, but in the end, it's all worth it I, I, uh, to see your stuff published and that sort of thing. That That's that's what we're after. So um, things are going well with that. Uh, things are going well with that. Um, I was glad that I that I did set up Mach 3 photography before I exited rather than, you know, just step from one. And then now what am I going to do type thing? Uh, I was re ready to go on day one, so it's all good. It's it's working out. Yeah, very, that's very your good. personal website, correct? Mach three. Yes, Mach three photography dot com is the website. Yes. But your photography work is published. Yes, my so places. so my personal business is Mach three photography, but I freelance with this Icon Sportswire, which they also push images to Getty and AP. So when I shoot. This past Sunday, I shot the Texans and the Jaguars. Mm -hmm. Those images went to Icon, but they also were were automatically sent to Getty and AP. So they go worldwide. As soon as you push them up at halftime, I push the, f the first half images. They are worldwide right out of the workroom there at uh, NRG Stadium. So you're not even like editing these photos. These photos look great in and of themselves. Uh, I'm, there's there's some quick editing. You you get it, you develop a workflow, and I've got it down now. But it took time to uh, you you because you have to caption them, so you have to uh, use code replacements, and that's a lot to get into. But basically, you know, I hit backslash H four. What what comes up on the screen is Houston Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson. So I use code replacements just. A three-letter code can give me all of that info in my caption, and uh, you can caption images in a hurry. Wow. And then, you, then you pull them up in an editing software, and uh, and you make yeah. that happen, and then you edit your images then. Well, a lot of folks that are, you know, sports fans will appreciate learning a little bit about your photography for sure. So what I want to do is just, um, I fell in love with so many of your photos. You can literally look at them for hours. They're incredible. Um, I particularly want to go over a few of them um, that you're like super proud of as well. And what I'll do is I will show them to our, um, you know, the folks that are watching this, say on YouTube and stuff. And again, I'll have this on the article as well. But let's talk about some of these pictures before we get into your book, which again, I'm so excited to talk to you about. But your photography is incredible and, and it's so noteworthy. I think we should definitely mention it. So um, we have a, a, a picture here at Pyeongchang, am I correct? Yes. That's the women's hockey team? Yes, that was the Winter Olympics in uh, 2018. Uh, was able to travel over there with my wife and uh, was able to shoot the hockey and some ice skating events, basically all the indoor stuff uh, I shot. And um, the, uh, the women's hockey team upset Canada and that was that was huge, and then they won the gold. So, um, very exciting times. There was a lot of photo ops there, you know, with the facial expressions, and that's really what I'm after. I want, I'm, I'm after reaction, um, face shots, trying to, trying to. I want to. Uh, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to tell a story at a football game. I was trying to tell a story at the Olympics there, in that I'm trying to put people who can't be there into that arena and feel what I'm able to feel and that sort of thing. So that that's that's basically my goal when I look through the viewfinder. That's what I'm looking for is, is something that is going to move somebody to go, oh, wow, that is an awesome shot. Look at her or look at him, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, because you really share that moment. You you know, you really do bring the person right to that event with the, with these 
images. They're incredible. Ken, let's talk about the next photo that I think is outstanding. It's Houston Astros infielder um, Jose Alt Altuve. 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 Yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit about that one? Yeah, uh, what I was after there is a lot of times I'll shoot for backgrounds. In, in this particular instance, um, they had the big H in the, in the greenery out there in center field. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there bored, just kind of looking in between, in between innings, looking for something to shoot. And he was standing out there. And, and so I basically just tried to frame him near that big diamond with the H for Houston um, in the center. Uh, just basically tried to frame him to uh, to show he's he's such an outstanding player, and uh, I knew that many people would like to see something like that. So that that's what I was after in that image. Do you get a lot of feedback on your photography too? Do folks leave a lot of comments and ask questions? They they ask a lot of questions. Um, feedback, um, not not so much on on uh, on individual images. Not not so much. But the <clears throat> the way that I uh, the way I look at it is when I walk away from an event, I know I, I know on Sunday after Sunday night when I walk out of an NFL game, I know if I had a good game or not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's luck. Sometimes it's hey, you know, you may not have had a touchdown in front of you for the entire game, or in a college game on Saturday night before that NFL game <clears throat> at NRG. There were three touchdowns that came right to me, but mm. they were all called all called back for holding penalties. So the <laughs> those images are worthless. You know the, the the play never really happened, so you can't use them anyway. But so there's there's uh, a little bit of luck involved. You want the play? It's kind of like soccer too. You you know if all the goals are at the other end of the, right. of the pitch, you know it. It does you really no good. That's a long reach to get something good down there, to get face shots from 100 yards away is tough. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. That's a great, great photograph. And then we have the women's soccer uh, midfielder, Carly Lloyd, Lloyd. Yes. Let's talk about her for a sec. Yeah, she's, uh, she scored her 100th international goal, and uh, that image was a biggie. Uh, that's where she's kissing the ball. Yeah, that's a great yes. picture. Yeah, she it was right after she scored it. She got the ball and she and she kissed it. That was that was a huge uh, a huge image there. Okay, Ken, let's talk about uh, Justin Rose. That one uh, that's uh, during Friday's four balls of the 2018 Ryder Cup. Yeah, that was uh, that was over in Paris, and uh, that shot. I think that was a tee shot. If I remember the the shot right, um, but but a lot of times, yeah, you got to take that. You got to take the lighting into effect and that sort of thing. Many times for uh, for PGA, I'll look for for black backgrounds with that morning sun coming up, and maybe it just highlights the side of their face. Right. But the background the background is all in the shade, so it's black. Man, you can get some stunning stuff, and so you're always looking for things like that. The, I'll go. I'll walk the course the day prior if I haven't been to the course before. I'll walk it the day prior and look and see what tee boxes are going to be good. Hey, that one faces east, so it's going to get that morning sun right in the face. You know that this next one's going to be backlit. You know that sort of thing. I'll get a general idea before the tournament starts on Thursday. Well, all that makes you such an incredible photographer. Let's That's talk true. about Tiger Woods. The picture yep. you got silhouetted, uh, silhouetted in the afternoon sky. I love that one. Love yeah, that. that one. That was it. Was overcast, and uh, when I was just framing that one up, to to shoot him, to shoot him properly exposed, it, it wouldn't have. It wouldn't even have been a keeper, and so I just I just bumped up the bumped up the shutter speed a little bit and and uh, darkened the image and. Uh, Made him a silhouette, basically. I knew that that uh, the clouds would be a good background. Oh, and beautiful! So uh, I like all the grass is all in that same focal plane. Yes, as I love pictures so, like that where you could see what's in yeah. the air. Oh, those are some of my favorites. Yeah. Um, one of my other favorites. I have two top favorites. Is the London one with the Ferris wheel? Yeah, the the London Eye one. Oh, that, that's a gorgeous. Uh, picture. My wife, my wife and I were over there on a mini vacation, seeing some friends, and uh, we were just walking. We, we'd gone up in the eye. We we rode it, and uh, 
I took some stuff from up there, some images from up, up in the uh, London Eye there. And we got off and we were walking back across the, the bridge. And I turned around and looked and the sun was setting. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy cow, that's, it's changing the entire color of the landscape over there, you know. So and you I, see it right through the, the image. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I just said, let's just sit here for about five minutes or so. Let that see if any clouds are going to get in front of that sun. And we'll, we'll just watch it here for a few and waited, waited about five minutes. And I got that one. That's one of my favorite shots of all time, actually. Oh, I love I, I that. Really like, love I really it. Like that shot. Now, do you um, also like let folks buy them so they can frame them like as prints? Yeah, um, you can get through my website. You can uh, the the licensed images no. So like the pro the pro football pro, the right. PGA your personal those, ones. Those are licensed. The, the personal stuff, yes, they can. And okay. I've got a I, I've got a link on on my site that says uh, buy unlicensed images here. If I you did click see that. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll make sure I run that across the screen so folks yeah. can, because I have some photographer friends of mine where I've done that, I've picked some, and they've sent me gorgeous frames. Yeah. It looks incredible on the wall. Yeah. And let's, lastly, before we get into your book, talk about the Marcus Erickson. Marcus Erickson. It says here, uh, Sweden, manu uh, Sweden maneuvers through the... Oh, that, that's the, the uh, form Formula One. Formula yes. One, that's it. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's definitely. talk about that one a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I... Uh, I shoot a couple of races a year, uh, Formula One over in Austin, and then the, the uh, they've got Formula One and they have the IndyCar series that runs through the uh, Circuit of Americas, uh -huh. which is in Austin, Texas. So I go over and shoot that. I've also shot NASCAR up at Texas Motor Speedway. That's a whole different ball of wax there, uh, learning to shoot uh, racing. But oh my gosh, I can only fun. imagine. It's a lot of fun, and you can do a lot of different things, you know. You, with that, there's a lot of, that goes into it. Um, I, I basically start off, um, you don't, even on a bright sunny day, you don't want to run a way high, high, high shutter speed mm -hmm. that stops the tires because then the car just looks like it's parked right there. So you, I normally just start off at about one five hundredth of a second, and you always get the whir on the tires, like Firestone, will always be all blurred out on the tires, which shows motion. When you're talking, of, when you're shooting uh, race cars, you need to show motion. You, you want to have a fast enough shutter speed that stops the car, mm -hmm. but you want to have a fast enough shutter, a, a slow enough shutter speed that shows the whir on the tires, which shows motion. The, the tires, the, the lettering on the tires will be all blurred out. They're, they're going to be, you can tell that those tires are really turning. You but, know, it's funny you mentioned that because that's the first thing my eye saw when yes. I looked at this picture. And I, I said, oh, my gosh, this car looks like it's in motion. But the Alfa Romeo, you can see the lettering. You yeah. can see all the detail on the car. It's incredible. That particular shot is called a panning shot. Mm -hmm. So what I did with that was I even slowed it down, slowed my shutter speed down more. I went to like 1 one twenty fifth of a second. And I'm standing there, and I just shoot the whole field as they come by. I find a background that I like with colors or or fencing that's going to look good, all blurred with the motion, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just get on the cars, get them locked up with the with the uh, autofocus. And as they go by, I'm just holding the shutter down and going. Brr, brr, wow. And I'd, uh, I'll have a thousand images. I'll get five that are good out of that, like the one you're seeing right there. Love that one. That's yeah. great. That's um, fun. It's just okay, so, things you can so, do. So if everybody wants to see your beautiful photography, they can visit your website. And um, as far as your drone footage goes, um, I saw some of your drone footage. It's awesome. I love the real estate drone footage because you yeah, can that's really get a great you know, perspective of the area, the, the whole that's layout of the home. Just tell us a little bit about your drone photography. Yeah, I started in 2015 when the commercial drones uh, first began. Uh, I hold a private pilot's license, so in the in the early days, I did the 333 exemption, which allows me to fly a drone commercially and make money with the drone. Uh, there are many folks out there who don't do that. They are breaking the law by yes. earning money with their drone, 
and they, they, they're given the drone, the true drone operator, a bad name. But uh, then the FAA came out with a Part 107, which is basically the same thing. Um, I just did my recurring test uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, where um, you basically you're coupling your private pilot license with a drone certificate too. So you get basically like an ID or a, a driver's license, a certificate from the FAA that, that says you're a drone pilot as well. So that, and that allows you to, to uh, fly it commercially and, uh, and make money. Um, it's serious business, drone. It is serious pilot. business. Yeah. And you need to, there's too many cowboys out there, you know, flying at night, flying near airports, flying over people. You can't do it. You, I, I don't, and I, I equate that to my 25 years in the Air Force. I don't bend or break any FAA rule at all. I just, that's that's a non-starter. So um, if I have a client that wants me to to fly in an area that you can't fly, I, I say I can't, I'm unable, can't fly there. So So you make sure you check out all the restrictions oh, yeah. beforehand. Exactly. Got an and app a lot on of folks are not doing that, unfortunately. Exactly. I pull up to a house. I have an app on my phone. I can check the airspace. If it is close to an airport, I'll call the tower and say, here's who I am. Here's what I've got. I'm going to be airborne for 15 minutes whenever you're able. Um, just, you know, like not really clearance, but I want to let you know that I'm going to be out here. Is, is that, are you guys all right with that? You bet. You want me to call you back when we're done? Nope. If you're going to be airborne for one battery, 15 minutes. That's fine. Just land it and you're good to go. So that's that's the way I roll. How much drone photography do you think you've shot so far? A lot? And yeah. An awful lot. Yeah. The uh the stills are the stills are good. Still photography is good with the drone. Uh I've got a an Inspire One Pro, which is the camera is this camera is almost as good as my DSLR. Wow. The, the sensor is very, very large. You can get very clear and I put a polarizer on it, so bright sunny days, it, it looks really, really good. Yeah. It's incredible. It, with, with that, it, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of risk involved, you know, with trees yeah. and foliage sure. and, and that sort of thing. And I don't want to put that drone through someone's picture window. So there is some planning. When you pull up to the house, it's like, all right, hey, how do I want to attack this thing here? I want to get this aspect, this angle. I'll go to this altitude first, approach the house here in a climbing, you know, in an ascent. As I as I approach the peak, I'm going to reveal that lake that's, that the house sits on in the in the backyard. I'll reveal yeah. the lake. It's going to be a, a revealing shot as I climb. Now, aside from the two clips that I'm showing folks as we're talking, um, is there any place that they can go to see your drone photography? Um, I don't really post that because those are it's all client driven. Mm -hmm. um, so those those two I've actually just borrowed from a client um, the the finished product and you know they gave me clearance to, to go ahead and, and I can post them on my website and that sort of thing just to show and um, I don't really have time to go out there and just make practice yeah I'm, you know if I can make money with it I want to be flying for a client I don't want to be of course, uh, just, of course. just burning up battery power you know yeah i don't blame you i don't blame you yeah. so let's get into your book it's called okay. on par and that's spelled p-a-r and of course i'll have all the information um across the screen for folks to see now um we talked about your your love of photography and you know you kind of started with that when you were in the military so right. you're a military man and tell us a little bit about what the driving force was first for you to write this book and a little bit about who Colonel Ralph Parr is and why you chose him to write about. What makes his story so noteworthy? Sure. Uh, I met Ralph uh, back in about 2005 or so and for the first time. I, I, had, I knew who he was, but I really didn't get... A chance to really talk to him but in about 2005 or so I got to know him very very well and that was on my final assignment there at Randolph and they've named the par the the officers club is now called the par club at Randolph they named it after him at a naming ceremony in 08 2008 and that's in the book as well but Ralph was a uh, 
he he was a uh, medically retired colonel and he flew p-38s in world war ii he was a double ace in korea flying f-86s and he flew f-4s in vietnam now i don't know of anyone else who did that that off the top of my head so that's tough to fly in three different huge wars like he or huge conflicts like he did um but in talking to him uh i'd sit there and listen to his stories and i was enthralled obviously there were libations involved too we're having a couple of cocktails at the the old club but just sitting there talking to him and you know what was when were you the most scared in your life and he'd go into a story and start talking about it's like then what'd you do well then what'd you do what was that guy thinking i don't you know and and he'd go into all and all the aspects of that particular mission or whatever Uh and I was I was totally enthralled in him. I, he's my hero, you know, and he's such a humble guy. No one knew, no one, unless you sat with him at the club like that. No one knew everything about him that that he was. He was a, you know, an awesome pilot, an awesome officer, father, husband. He was a great guy, and so if you searched for him on the internet. You wouldn't really find anything about him at that there's, point. There's some stuff some out things. there. Yeah, there is some stuff out there. But uh, like I said, he was so humble. He didn't walk around saying, you know, I was one of the best fighter pilots of all time. Mm-hmm. He was, but he, he would never let on that, that he was that guy. So uh, I was getting ready to retire then, and, and it was late 2010. Mm-hmm. And he was at the club one night, and he went home at about 8 or so. And two retired 06s, uh, colonels, came up and we were just standing at the same table. I hadn't left yet. We were just standing there BSing at the table. And I said, you know, someone really needs to tell Ralph's story. I said, that that guy, he, he's he got stories that you can't even imagine. And they know, him very, they know him probably better than I did at the time. And so they, they're standing there and they looked at each other and they, they're like, well, you're going to have the time. you got the money. Why don't you do it? And I was like, oh, my God. So I came home, and uh, I came back over to Houston. Then We were in, over in Houston at the time. I drove back over here, and I talked to my wife over the weekend. I said, hey, uh, Pick and Smudge were talking to me the other night, and they think that I need to sit down and interview Ralph and, you know, a form, formal interview type and write, basically write his book. And she's like, well, I know if you if you sign up for something like that, then I know that you're going to go in full afterburner and give it your all. So, yeah, if, you, if that's something that you want to do, by all means, do it. So I waited until Tuesday. That that was Friday night. I came home Saturday, talked to my wife over the weekend. On two, I waited until Tuesday morning. So Tuesday morning, about 9 or 10, I called over to his assisted living home in New Braunfels, Texas, which is just north of San Antonio. And I said, Ralph, Ken Murray. He says, yeah. And I said, hey, good seeing you the other night. Uh, I was talking to Pick and Smudge, and they said, it's high time that someone writes a book on you, writes your story, basically. And he kind of sat there, and he's like, well, that means we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk about airplanes and flying, and you're going to tape record all the stories and then regurgitate them into a book format. I said, you got it. And there was kind of a pregnant pause again, and he said, I'm in. So I said, okay, if you're in, I'm in. So uh, starting right after that, I made 19 trips over there to New wow. Braunfels. It's a three-hour drive. and Over I would go, what course of time, the 19 trips? Yeah, uh, oh, like from, how long? A year, yeah, from, two years? From 2010 until 12. The so book was two years. Done, yes. Um. And so what I would do is I'd, I'd sit down here at home and, and in a Word document, just write down about 30 questions, two or three pages worth of questions. But in those questions were follow-on questions that were going to come to me as in his responses, you know. And I would have all those on tape and on, on a digital recorder. I would go over there on like a Wednesday morning tape him from like 10 until noon or one when it was time for his lunch and leave. 
The next day, Thursday, see him. The next day, Friday, see him. Uh -huh. Go to the club that night, sit and visit with him in an informal atmosphere. Now there's no book really book stuff going on. And then come back Saturday and the next week or two, I would just sit down with that digital recorder and wear a keyboard out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he passed, right, in 2012? He passed uh, December 7th of 12, which is ironic because he entered the Army Air Corps on December 7th of 41. 40, yeah, 41. So, um, yeah, he came in and he... It was Army Air Corps at the time, and everyone wanted him to be a instructor at every school that he went to to learn how to fly a particular airplane or airframe. They wanted him to stay and be an instructor. And he's like, "No, I want to go. I want to go fight. I want to go to war type thing." So he was he was a character. He was a great guy. So this book, I mean, I read it, and it it truly is fascinating to read. And I, I want to just let folks know that you don't have to be in the military or like an avid military obsessed person this is a book for anybody and everybody country loves patriotism really wants to understand what he went through for our protection and safety all the way from dating back to vietnam correct yes from world war ii through vietnam exactly and that was that was kind of the inner arguments that I when I when I started writing, um, I wanted to write it in a way that you would a, a person like you would understand that has no ties to the military, no nothing. But if you read it, I wanted to uh, I wanted to explain away all the Air Force jargon, you know, that that I could I could have included in there without any explanation and all the Air Force guys would have got it and just kept right on flying through it, mm -hmm. reading it, where you would have been going, what? That's like six acronyms yeah. in a row type thing. I well, wanted you did to get a great job at that because I, I it that. really, when I was reading it, I, I didn't feel like confused about what you were talking about. You really went through um, like putting you in the moment that he was in right. during the situations that he was in. So let's talk a little bit about um, he was credited with downing, t what, 10 enemy aircraft? In Can Korea, you tell yes. us what makes this story so noteworthy? And just let's touch on some of the major accomplishments so our listeners yeah. can get a feel. Yeah, to become a fighter ace, you have to down five enemy aircraft. He downed 10, so he was a double ace in Korea. Um, that's that's no easy feat. And the the reason being is that in that day and age, uh, flying the F-86, it had six guns that were right near the nose, the intake in the nose of the uh -huh. aircraft. All he had was guns. So he relied on his eyesight to find the MiG, chase them down, get within firing range of his bullets, right. and shoot them down. Where today, you fly a four ship of F-15s or F-22s or F-35s out there, they've got a <clears throat> they've got it down to a science where you launch and leave, you know, you're launching a missile from 30 miles away. Oh, sure. And leave. You launch and leave. And that missile goes and hits that target. And so it's a whole different ball of wax. 30 miles, you wouldn't even see that guy yet. Where So he had to find and pick out those 10 enemy aircraft and, and keep his behind alive as sure. well. You know, so I mean that's a miracle in and of itself. It is. Survived all of these. Encounters. It is. It is, and we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about the Vietnam uh, mission as well, where that that one he just about went down in that oh, one. Oh so, my word! Yeah. So he's the only person who was ever awarded both the Distinguished Service Cross and the Air Force Cross. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Tell the us Air a little bit about that. The Air Force Cross uh, came about in 65, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But like 1965 is when the Air Force Cross came out. Before that, it was the Distinguished Service Cross. Um, they are equal in rank of medals. They each are one below the Medal of Honor. So that's, that's how high that, that's how prestigious that, that award is. 
And I, I include the uh, the write ups, his citations for those awards. Those are in the in an appendix in the book. You can read about the the missions that uh, that um, that talk about and describe what actually happened. Why he is legitimately uh, eligible for this for this award. But the thing I want people to know is that you know. The Medal of Honor is the next, the next highest thing, and he got two of these that that are in second place, right behind it. So, um, the, and the the reason he's the only one to uh, be awarded both of them was that it's tough to fly in two separate conflicts. Not very many guys flew in World War II and Korea, and then Vietnam for sure. Um, so it's it was it's tough just for timing to, to be awarded both those. And you have to have missions that, that are, um, that make you eligible for those, for those awards. Right. So, so to they, put it in perspective, uh, tell us why it's such a big deal to receive these awards. And it's not just something that the government hands out to folks. Just no, like, it's not just something that someone hands out to folks. There, it, there's a big process that goes on, that goes on. And uh, there's a lot of uh, legitimizing that goes on. They, they, they need to make sure that it's legit so that you don't want to ever get in a situation where they are just handing out awards like candy. That, that's, not how, that's not how the military works. You, you earn those awards and through blood, sweat and tears and, you know, risking your life. You're risking your life to save ours, you know. Of course. So, so, of course. That's why, as any you know, patriotic American, I had such a great appreciation for for the life he led and what he did to protect and serve. And exactly. um, you know, it, it, it's really commendable that you took years out of your life to tell his story. And um, folks need to know his story. They, they do they really do. Well, they really do. And that that. I, I've seen this uh, saying, you, you'll see him in cross stitchings and that sort of thing. And it's um, the home of the free because of the brave. Yes. And that, is, that epitomizes Ralph right there. That's what he was all about. You know, he, he loved this country. He was a red blooded American. And I mean, he would have done anything for the betterment of this country. I of promise. Course. And I'm sure that, you know, surrendering your life to the military has an impact on your personal life as well. And I'm sure in your book, maybe you touch upon a few of those things a little bit here yep. and there. And, um, you know, the sacrifice that he made to protect us exactly. and serve us. So no, let's talk right. about Vietnam. Uh, is that Kyung Yen? Kaysan. Kaysan. I'm yeah. so bad at pronouncing these things. No, no worries. So tell us a little bit about... Um, these low-level passes against uh, enemy firepower in, what, poor weather, I believe? Yes. That, we, during we, this battle? That particular mission, uh, the Battle of Quezon, Quezon had been under siege for months, and we were about to get run out of there, actually. And uh, they had gun emplacements on a hill, and uh, the runway sat kind of down in a valley, and these gun emplacements for months had just been racking on C-130s coming in slow and slow to land, just nailing them and, and, and you know, doing a lot of damage, killing people and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about Quezon. Like, what is hear Quezon, that? I'm like, well, what is it? I have no clue. Yeah, Quezon was an outbase there, and in, in, it was a base in, in uh, South Vietnam okay. and a military base. It had Marines on it. Uh, Air Force firepower to uh, back up the, the ground guys. And so Ralph was flying the F-4 at the time, and um, which w is a two-seater. He had a back-seater. Uh, Tom McManus was his name on this particular mission. Anyway, with th on this particular mission, what happened was uh, they'd been trying to get this gun emplacement. It, it was a uh, ZSU-23. That doesn't mean anything to you, but it was a, basically a four-gun, and it's if you've seen the old movies where they're turning and, and they're, it's basically four big guns and they're, they're turning, trying to track enemy aircraft wow. as they come by. And these guns are, that's what was on this hillside. So and this is all like manual. It's all yeah, done like 
Yes. The, it's the like North, really very little automation taking the, place. The North there. Vietnamese had these guns, and that's what they were firing on us with. And so we've been trying to take those guns out for months. Mm. This particular day, uh, he, he heard over the radio from a FAC, from a forward air controller in a small light airplane, an L-19 bird dog is what it was, mm-hmm. said that they were taking a bunch of firepower from this hillside. So that bird dog talked him onto that target, talked Ralph onto that target, you know, basically walked him onto, hey, do you see the, you know, do you see the, the crossing roads? Yes. Okay, go northeast of the crossing roads, um, two clicks. Do you see the building? Yes, I see the building. Okay, from the building, it is 300 yards up the hillside uh, near a, a bunch of rocks. Mm-hmm. Do you see the rocks? Got it. That's your target. So Ralph made eight passes. He had he had napalm on board and he had guns. So he went across the first pass with a dry run. He went across it and he, now he's flying at 350, 400 knots at ground level. He's he's down on the deck in bad weather. He pull up off the target and look back over his shoulder, never losing the target. Always keeping his eye on the target. He'd make get set up for another run. Came by, dropped napalm. Came back by, dropped na- napalm. All he had left was guns, and he, so he came by with strafing runs, just using his gun as his as his last resort. And How he did up, he not get shot down in eight runs? When they landed, they had they had over twenty holes in their aircraft, and some of them were like through and through. Oh, they went sure. all the way through from one side of the fuselage to the other. They landed, and they he and Tom McManus counted up the holes, and uh, he was actually put in for a medal of honor for that, that particular mission. And um, it's been shot down a couple of times. Um, my opinion, I think that it's uh, kind of a law of recency type thing. Mm. In the days leading up to that, there'd only been a couple of guys killed where months prior to that, there were many. Had those guns been taken out then, he probably would have, have received the Medal of Honor for that particular sortie. So um, there are those who say, no way is he should he be eligible for it there are others who say there's no reason why he should not have it that's what that medal is yeah. for is so, there ever a chance that they will give it to him or is it kind maybe, of over and done oh it, it's gonna it's gonna take probably the act of a congressman or something like that yeah, to yeah, roll yeah. in and, and uh help push the paperwork to make it sure. make it happen that's so, always the way that's always the yeah. way exactly um let's talk about in 1953 that he downed a soviet Aleutian? The, the IL, the Aleutian 12. Aleutian? Yeah, Let's we call talk it a little bit about that. Uh, On that, that day. That provoked like an international thing, right? That, that was the last day of the Korean War. That was July 27th of 53. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the ceasefire, the armistice had been signed, mm-hmm. but it didn't go into effect until either 10 o'clock or midnight that night. So his marching orders when he stepped to his aircraft that day were anything that's flying that is not U.S., down it. It, It's not supposed to be airborne. So what they were going to do was was take a trip up north into North Korea and see what what enemy aircraft were still on the ground. They were basically just kind of logging, hey, here's, here's how many aircraft are at this field, you know, that sort of thing. So the armistice had been signed. As he's flying along, he sees this twin engine IL-12 coming coming across the Yalu into North Korea. Mm-hmm. And he was like, whoa, that's not supposed to be there. Who is that? So he maneuvers so they can't see him. That's a it's a big, slow moving, you know, twin engine aircraft. And so he maneuvers so they can't see him and comes in behind them, and it's got a red star on the tail. Which means, so our listeners know, it, it was it was Chinese or Russian, yeah. It was mm. it was enemy. So he takes a look at it, and the big thing then was, you know, basically where is he? He doesn't want to get in a, and he's got nine kills. This would be his tenth. Mm-hmm. So there are some there are some people who say he was after the double ace. There are others who say it was an enemy aircraft. That was his marching orders. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what that was his ROE. His rules of engagement were, it's not us, it's down. So 
he uh, maneuvers, sees that the star. He's like, uh, he wants to make sure that they're not in, they're not north of the Yalu River. He right. wasn't south of the Yalu River. He's checking maps. He's looking at the ground. Yep, we definitely are here. He pulls up, makes a gun pass on him, and the wing comes off. He downs that airplane. Wow. Well, there were 19 Russian generals that were being transported in that airplane back to Vladivostok. That's, and they were just cutting the corner, heading to Russia. 19 Russian 19 generals. Russian generals that is huge crew. in and of yeah. itself. Exactly. There were 19 Russian generals and four crew, I think, for a total of 23, if my memory serves right. So when he lands, uh, I mean, he's under scrutiny. He's the, he went through like 56 hours of uh, interrogation with the CIA. Oh, yeah. And they're, you know, the, we're trying to get our story and, and figure out what actually happened on our side. They're doing the same thing. How could this have happened? You know, the Russians are. So um, that's probably a book all in of itself. Another, you know, another or one. Or a movie. Is, yeah, exactly. So, um <laughs> Like I said, he was he was under a lot of scrutiny there for a long time, and and uh, even, you know, he he, uh, I think that that bothered him. He he, you know, all the way to the end, he 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 probably had that in the back of his mind at all times, you know, for all the way to the end of his life. So, did he talk to you about that? Like the emotions that he that he connected to that event? Did he feel guilt? Um, was he proud of that moment? Like he, uh, he, uh, he didn't, he wasn't guilty. He, he didn't feel guilt that I know of, he, but he wasn't, wasn't boisterous about it either. Hey, I got those guys, that sort of thing. He was not that guy at all. Like I said, he did what he was, uh, you know, he, he did what he was programmed to do on that's that particular mission. Well, they told him no exactly. aircraft, right? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So he did what he was told. He had no idea who was on it. Right. You know. That's it could an have incredible been, moment. It, it could have been beans and bullets. Who knows? But it had 19 Russian generals on it. So. Right, right, right. So he received 10 distinguished flying crosses, right? Yeah. Why is this historically remarkable? That be it's hard to get them. There there are you know, I've I've got two air medals and that's huge. I he he had tens and tens of air medals you know it was it, he was just he was that guy he, he was one of the best fighter pilots to ever fly in the united states air force he really was and again the military does not hand out no medals no. just like candy i mean no. you have to truly earn these things exactly. correct? exactly yeah yeah people need they i would love for people to read it to review it uh to to just learn more about him, you know, and, and many will say, why do I want to know about this guy? Read the book because you're going to go, my God, I'd never even heard of that guy. Right. And he was something else. And, and he really was. And it's a great way to pay uh, to him and to show, you know, that we keep his memory alive. Exactly. What he did to serve our country and everything that he sacrificed and yeah. just to know about everything that he accomplished, like all the little minute details of things that you go over in your book, it's incredible. Let's talk a little bit about the documentary, which is very, very exciting. Yes. Can you tell folks exactly what the story is with the documentary? Yeah, what, um, there's a, a documentary company that's uh, affiliated with uh, San Francisco State University. And what they do is they are contracted through the VA. And this year they they put out a, a uh, they put out four 12 minute shorts that go that will make a one hour documentary. And so they contacted me about eight months ago and they said, Hey, we're we want to focus on Ralph Parr for his for the Korean War portion. And with these, they're talking about dead folks. So they are going to do a 12 minute short on him. It's been shot. They, they came and interviewed me uh, on two, two separate days. They interviewed his daughter and, uh, and they interviewed his son, his, uh, stepdaughter and stepson. And so, um, and I got him a bunch of footage through the archives 
uh, Air Force archives that they'll use. And so that's in the works. It should be out in November of 19. Where and, are they releasing that, Ken? Um, that it's What's probably, the distribution so, like? It might be like a Netflix or a Hulu or something like that. I'm not really wow. sure at this point, um, but it'll be something like that. And of yeah. course, when you get all that information, you'll let us know and we'll post that. We'll update the article so that folks can, you know, make sure they have that for reference too. You bet. That's an incredible accomplishment. We're yep. so excited Maybe. to see that. I can't wait to. It's it's uh, they got some good stuff. I know that. Anything else about your book that you want to touch upon? You want to let listeners know anything about the kernel that you feel is noteworthy to mention? Um, I just think that uh, that for those who are hesitant, give it a chance. You know, go ahead and, and, and take a look at it. Get the Kindle version and, and read it on your Kindle. Mm -hmm. It is the perfect gift for that grandfather, father, uncle, aunt or uncle, whatever, um, who has everything. Yes. Get, it as a get it as a stocking stuffer. They would love it. Anyone who served in, any veteran, but anyone who served in World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, they, they're going to have ties to that book because it, I've got maps and that sort of thing. They're going to know... Hey, I was stationed right there, you know, that, that sort of thing. That's you know. a perfect stock, you know, did, stocking exactly. gift too for Christmas. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know Ralph Parr, but I knew of, of guys like him, or I knew there was a guy like him in, uh, you know, at, at Quezon sort of thing. So, yeah, it's going to be good. One what? of the stories, that, one of the stories that they'll read in there, uh, you talk about the red stripe. And the red stripe actually is on the cover of the book. The, the cover was a, a painting by Ross Buckland, who is a, uh, he's a Canadian artist. And he was so nice. I contacted him because I love that painting. He met Ralph back in the 07, 08 time frame, I think. And Ralph told him the story of when he jumped 16 MIGs. So that is the cover. It's a wraparound. So the, the painting actually goes all the way across the spine and across the back of the book as well. And that's, we'll put a shot of that up here so yeah, that folks can see. And that's, that's the entire painting. But Ross loved Ralph, and he's, and so when I asked him if I could use, you know, that I was interested in using that painting as the book cover, he was all about it. He, he free, free gratis. He's like, you bet, use it. So I did, and then I sent him a hard, hard back when it was, when it was done. Wonderful. Get the red stripe I want to talk about real quick. Sure. Oh, Ralph was implementing psyops, psychological ops, mm -hmm. before the Air Force had even thought about psyops. Do we, and we do psyops all the time now. Sure. But one day he's out there with his crew chief at the aircraft, and his crew chief had some red duct tape. Mm -hmm. So he, they were, they were in the chief's squadron. The Indian chief's squadron is what it was called. So he took that. Uh, red duct tape and he put a red stripe just like a like a football helmet type thing uh -huh. a red stripe across the top and you can see it in an image in the book uh, of his helmet on top of his casket at his funeral the red stripe is still there and his crew chief was kind of like what why are you doing that and he said because he said when those guys when i face someone out there they're that close to where they can see into the cockpit when they're in a dogfight situation right and I want, and that guy happens to survive, I want him to go back to the, his squadron, his enemy squadron, and say, I don't know who that guy was, but I met up with a guy with a red stripe on his helmet, <laughs> and you don't want to mess with him. What a but, great story. Exactly. And it was just little things like that that are throughout the book that um, uh, I just... He made me laugh, and it was it was a joy just to get to know him even better and 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 talk to him. Um, one other thing with the book, uh, I, what I tried to do was when I like when he would tell me a story that it included a date. While I was writing the book, I just wore out Google by what were the current events of that day, what what was happening on July twenty seventh of nineteen fifty three, and I'd pull up the. Uh, Indianapolis newspaper front page and just a PDF of it that happens to be online and read it. What, what was going on during that day? And I tried to incorporate that just to say, you know, while 
while Ralph was getting ready at 6 a.m. while Ralph's getting sh he's shaving and getting ready for his morning mission a half a world away this is what was going on in the U.S. and so it I, I tried to tie things together with current events that were actually happening so that people who were alive during that time you know they'll, they'll be able to go oh yeah that, that's right that that was happening about them. Well, that's that's another reason I love the book because it's very relatable and it does pull you right into the event. So, you know, thank you so much for writing this book and, and letting us all know who this incredible human being was and everything that he did for our country. And as a patriot, you know, um, I'm so proud to know that it's folks like him are the reason why we're sitting here today. So. That's right. I agree. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Kenan. If folks need to reach out to you, um, do you have a way they can reach out to you they, with they any can, questions? You bet. They can reach out to me through my website at mock3photography.com or okay. uh, don't hesitate to shoot me an email if you want to. Then that would be onparauthor at gmail.com. On okay, par I'll run that. Yep. Yep. I'll run that across. So that's yeah. onparauthor at gmail.com. At gmail.com. Yep. Okay, great. Because sometimes folks want to reach yep. out to you to ask a question of one thing or another. So, sure thing. okay, thank you so much, Ken. It was such a joy having you here today. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it, Caroline. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.